Well, when I qualified in 1962 as a medic, I really thought I was going to end up as a consultant physician, because that was the treadmill that most of my contemporaries followed. Uh, so I went into training in internal medicine and followed a conventional path. But as an undergraduate, I'd always had an interest in mechanisms of disease. And actually, in my final year as a student at Guy's, the professor of medicine um, had offered me a vacation um, lab, lab assistant position. So I spent some time in the lab and was really quite interested in how cells and molecules work. In those days, you, you, might, you might recall, we really actually weren't that interested in cells and molecules in medicine. We were more interested in physiological systems. But I realized that physiological systems weren't that exciting for me. Um, so that was the beginning of my kind of curiosity about whether I would pursue um, a line in medicine where I could combine research with clinical practice. And immunology was a very uh, appealing new subject that has had, had kind of begun to appear in the medical literature, largely in relation to transplantation. But the other field in which immunology was beginning to, sh to show some interesting research findings was in rheumatology and autoimmune diseases. So to cut a long story short, I um, went into rheumatology with the purpose of uh, getting into a research fellowship, which would take me into an immunology lab. And this is what really happened. So um, I trained in medicine and got a fellowship to work with an immunologist. And that was the beginning of my uh, research-orientated clinical career. Well, so inevitably the issue was whether the diseases that were the most disabling in rheumatology, which had an immunological basis, the reason I went into rheumatology, uh, the, the disease that was staring me in the face in the clinics I did was rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, it, it appeared from early findings in rheumatology that the occurrence of uh, autoantibodies, which basically told you that tolerance to autoantigens had broken down in some way, was an important underlying cause. But actually, thinking was a bit um, superficial. And most of the findings suggested that these autoantibodies had nothing to do with disease pathogenesis, that they were diagnostic markers rather than disease-causing molecules. Nevertheless, that was the start. But I was very fortunate that the immunologist that I worked with was one of the pioneers in cellular immunology, which was a very new field in those days. And the question that fascinated my supervisor, which therefore reflected on what I would do in his lab, was how immune cells talk to each other. And the conventional view had been that cells talk to each other by cell contact. But recent discoveries had led to the description of soluble factors that were not antibodies, that were proteins, that were released by cells that acted as messenger molecules. And these uh, molecules initially were called lymphokines because they were thought to be released by lymphocytes. But then it was realized that these molecules actually were also released by many other cells. Uh, and hence the term became more embracing and the term cytokine was invented. So that was the field that I started my research in in 1969. 
And actually, my first paper was a publication in Nature on the description of a cytokine released by lymphocytes that had non-specific action on other cells and appeared to confer delayed hypersensitivity type reactions on the recipient. Um, the 1980s heralded a very important change in our understanding of cellular immunology. And the cytokines that hitherto proved rather elusive suddenly became accessible for, for investigation uh, because of the huge advances that had occurred in understanding protein structure and in, in uh, cDNA technology. And a number of cytokines were then uh, identified and characterized as distinct molecules at the cDNA level. And that meant you could actually get hold of specific messenger molecules that could be of interest. And in mid-1980s, the laboratory that was working on cytokines and had access to some of these reagents was the laboratory of Mark Feldman. And Mark Feldman at that time worked at UCL in Professor Mitchison's department. And we knew each other. And um, actually, in interestingly, a visiting worker from the USA who knew both of us uh, was the one who, at a social evening, said, why don't you guys t work together? Because you're both interested in autoimmunity. You're both interested in cytokines. And actually, Mark at that time was doing some very innovative work uh, in, in uh, looking at the function of cytokines, which I wasn't because I had largely given that work up. So this was a meeting of minds that was absolutely critical to the discovery of anti-TNF uh, because Mark and I forged a, a friendship which has lasted um, all these years and actually was a very synergistic relationship in terms of scientific res research and translation because he was uh, laboratory based and I was uh, clinical based but with a laboratory and I think in translation you know after all what is translation it is to be able to translate into another language and the language here we are talking about is translating basic research into clinical practice and to do that, I think you really need to understand both sides of the language. You, you, you couldn't, for example, translate from German into English unless you understood both German and English. So I think that this kind of uh, spectrum of knowledge and expertise that we both encompassed between us uh, was very fruitful. So that was a very critical development in the discovery of anti-TNF. Because basically, we then embarked on a very long project, which began in 1985, and really until 1992, when we treated the first patient with anti-TNF monoclonal antibodies, uh, was spent in developing concepts and validating uh, the concept that TNF, amongst many other cytokines that were produced by uh, cells in the joint, in a system that Mark had developed to study cells in test tubes, actually was important. And the way it was discovered to be important by, was by using neutralizing antibodies uh, to uh, TNF in a, in a cellular system in vitro, uh, in which these cells derived from rheumatoid joints produce large quantities of many cytokines, including TNF. So if you neutralize TNF in the system with a monoclonal antibody, it essentially downregulated the production of other pro-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and GMCSF. And that was the beginning of the idea that TNF might be a good therapeutic target. Now, of course, working with cells in a test tube isn't the same as working in a complex physiological system. And so we uh, then 
felt that we had to have, have some physiological validation of the concept. And in order to do this, uh, we used a mouse model of rheumatoid arthritis, which I had been working on previously to understand more basic immunology. Well, that model, uh, called the DBA mouse model of arthritis, is actually a very good model of rheumatoid arthritis. It has limitations, but it does reflect a rheumatoid arthritis in patients because the genetic makeup of this mouse is very similar to the HLA-DR uh, background that rheumatoid patients have. And to cut a long story short, we, we were able to uh, reverse and ameliorate arthritis induced in these mice with a therapeutic anti-TNF antibody, mouse anti-TNF antibody. So at that point, we were ready for the big step. And the question was, how would we make this big step? Well, at first, we thought that we would actually try and develop a neutralizing agent in our own laboratory because we had someone actually working with a soluble receptor to TNF, which is an inhibitor. And the possibility arose that uh, we might in some way use this inhibitor for inhibiting excess TNF produced in rheumatoid joints. Uh, but it became apparent to us, A, that there were patent issues through which we couldn't circumvent easily, and B, more importantly, that there were production issues uh, that we could never overcome because actually our mouse work had told us that you need gram quantities of these reagents to be able to do anything useful in, in man. And that really led to a search for a biotechnology company that might be using anti-TNF for um, research purposes. And here we were very fortunate because there was a company in the USA that had developed monoclonal anti-TNF antibodies, one of the first chimeric anti-TNF antibodies for the treatment of septic shock, in which TNF had been shown to play an important part by other workers in the USA. And these trials uh, were not going very well because basically the expected results that had been um, encouraging this company to use anti-TNF in sepsis were giving a negative result in patients. So this company had manufactured large quantities of anti-TNF antibody that they basically didn't have a very good use for. Well, as all these uh, fortuitous things in science, we happen to know the scientific um, head of the laboratory that was making these antibodies. And to cut a long story short, he agreed to allow us to treat initially 10 patients and subsequently 20 patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And the first patient was treated here in London at Charing Cross Hospital on the 28th of April, 1992. And of course, we didn't know whether this could be harmful to patients or beneficial. And I have to say here that research like this is never possible unless the patients agree to take part in it. So throughout the development of this story, we owe a huge debt to our patients who, who were volunteering, volunteering for these studies without any certainty of a beneficial outcome. Uh, so not only for the initial study, but for the subsequent studies which we took to take it to the later stages of clinical trials. Uh, this was the case. Well, as, as we now know, it's widely known that actually anti-TNF in these patients proved to be highly effective, dramatically so. So dramatically that we really doubted whether this could be sustained in the long term because all the theory of this background work was that in this complex system of multiple cytokines, multiple pathways being involved in pathogenesis, that blocking one molecule could not possibly lead to long-term benefit. So after the initial short-term studies, the issue was, could we embark on long-term studies? And this was, at that time, um, not something that anyone had con contemplated. 
I think monoclonal antibodies are very expensive to produce. And people thought that basically this would be a proof of concept trial um, and that it would be unrealistic to expect A, that the antibodies would go on working for long enough, and if they did, whether they could be affordable. So there was a bit of a gap before the company that we were working with, which was a biotechnical technology company without very big funds, were able to go into partnerships and raise enough money to actually undertake a long enough trial to demonstrate that this could be a long-term therapy for a chronic disease. Well, that happened in 1996. We, by then, we had designed a clinical trial in which anti-TNF antibody was given in combination with methotrexate and as a monotherapy. And the results of this trial have been seminal in the future development of anti-TNF therapy in that they showed that both therapies worked, but that the combination with methotrexate worked better. By the way, methotrexate is the conventional affordable treatment for rheumatoid arthritis, and that was already widely in use. But of course, only about 50% of patients were responding to methotrexate alone. Well, we, we now know that anti-TNF, um, especially with methotrexate, co-therapy, is highly effective in about 70% of rheumatoid patients. It has a significant toxicity profile, side effect profile, um, especially the problem of susceptibility to infections. But in, in proper settings and with proper supervision, uh, this really can be managed very well, and physicians now know how to manage it. 